I think we're good. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the CG Cookie weekly Wednesday live stream. We do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, and that's minus six if you're outside, minus six GMT if you're outside of the States. And usually I post the topic an hour or two beforehand, and I usually tell you the week before what we're going to be doing on the next week's episode. So next week, I'm going to be doing a, uh, I'm going to be drawing three heads of, if you guys follow me, my character Red, she has three brothers, and I'm going to show how to draw three characters that still have a familiar uh, facial structure where you can kind of tell they're related, and we'll go through how to go about doing that. But today, we're going to be talking all about color. Now, this is one of my favorite topics to explore because I feel like there is so much to learn and I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what I know about it, but I've definitely studied it pretty intensely. And if you want a full course on it, we actually have one on cgcookie.com and you can find that below. And it's like, uh, I believe it's 18 tutorials and it really goes through like what's the difference between CMYK and RGB, when should you use them? Uh, things about what is color, why is hue, saturation, and value so important in understanding it, and what's hue shifting, things like that. And the more that you get more familiar with color, I do feel like your pieces will just start elevating themselves just because of your understanding of color. Now, like I said, color is a never-ending learning experiment and process. So I'm just excited to talk to you guys about this, and if you guys want to throw more of your input of what you've learned about color during this, please do so. And if you have a question for me, please put at CG cookie concept before your question or comment. And that way we can have a discussion while I'm going back and forth between the Cintiq and my second monitor. And that way I can see it really quickly on the fly. Now, as we start off these streams, I like to ask where you guys are watching from. So if you want to put that in the comment section while I'm finishing up the marketing here, and then we will jump right into it. And part of the reason I'm doing the stream today, I was really debating last night what I wanted to do for the stream. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do this one because I felt like I needed a lot of uh, information or a lot of pre-work to get it going. But this morning I, I took some time out and I really thought about what I wanted to talk about and I made up a, a big list of what I want to go through with you guys. So I'm pretty excited. There's going to be a lot of movie talk. I feel like we can learn so much from film, especially from directors of past and modern directors that really utilize color to tell a story. Because I feel like with color, you can say something very loud and very prominent without having to actually say a word. And color can be such a storytelling mechanic that if you use it to your advantage, the person looking at your piece can get a sense of emotion, a sense of what you're trying to say. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of the movies that I feel represent that very well. And also, I want to hear what movies you guys have felt over the years have inspired you on a color level or just stand out to you as being well produced with color. So let me make sure we're all good here. I'll do the quick shout outs and then we'll get started. Okay, Christy says, hello from Oregon. Same with Gypsy Hummingbird. Miss Chibi Artist says, hi from Michigan. Oxalion Ox says, from, hello from Italy. Well, hello all the way from the east side, east hemisphere of the world. Lady Averin, oh, just says, hi. Well, hello. Uh, one of the Dundane says, hey, hey, from Belgium. Lady Coyote says, hello, from Texas. CMH39 just says, hey. Oh, there we go. A Lady Averin says, hi, from Washington State. Resinope says, hello, from Venezuela. Okay. Uh, Tigil, I know you're going to have a lot of movies to say, so I'm excited to have a conversation with you about it. And those are some good ones. And I, I will actually talk about animation movies and how they utilize color, and especially movies like Up. But uh, we'll jump into that when we get start talking about the movies. Uh, Faithful says, hi, from Washington. Hey, Faith, how are you doing? Kratos says, hello, from Colombia. Haz Hal says, hello, from Mexico. Uh, hola. Shaina says, hello, from Canada. John from Indiana. And CMH is from Georgia. Okay, 
So I'm going to jump right into it because, like I said, I'm really excited about today. So let's talk about color. Now, I'm not going to get into the fundamentals of what color is because I feel like I have done an entire course and we've done streams about that specifically in the past. I really want to dig into a specific area of color and a lot of it is evoking emotion or a mood with color. And it's something that probably isn't talked about enough with illustration because I feel like with concept art, you're more or less trying to push out a concept that reads very easily and well to a viewer or to an art director so that the concept is very solid and you can get an understanding of what you're looking at very quickly. But with illustration, you can play with color dynamics and evoke a story with just the colors that you're selecting. And we can go like, we can literally have hours and hours upon discussion about color and how to use it. Uh, is there a right way to use it? And I'm not gonna get so much into that. I'm gonna be talking about very specific examples and I wanna just honestly have a conversation and a discussion with you guys because I'm excited about uh, this topic and especially with film. If I wasn't an artist, I feel like being a film critic would be my second career, if not doing something with biology. And I take it very seriously. And when a director or a cinematographer or whoever is behind the color choices, be behind uh, the wardrobe, the sets, um, everything that you see in the frame, I have so much respect for them and what they're trying to say. So let's talk about color. So to start off, color is relative. So what I feel when I see the color yellow may be different than what you see when you see the color yellow. Now, that's not to say either of us are right and neither of us are wrong. It just, it's relative to us based on our, our experiences on seeing the color in the past and what we associate that color with. And for me, yellow represents more of like the cancer symbol of hope and uh, for you, maybe it represents a flower or something bright or maybe uh, one of those crossing signs on the road. It, it will all depend on your situation. Now, when we grew up, we usually watched a lot of cartoons, or most of us did, and Beauty and the Beast was one that really affected me as a kid. It still holds up as one of my favorite uh, movies, animated movies, because of how serious it took itself, almost like a Ghibli film. But uh, since I didn't start watching Ghibli films till I was in my uh, 13 and up, uh, Disney, I would say, got a lot of my childhood and Don Bluth. So Beauty and the Beast recently released a Blu-ray. And this was the frame of what it looked like. Now, something intrigued me about this because something just seemed off. And immediately I knew that the color seemed really like in my face. It was punching me. I was hurt. <laughs> and I did some research on why I thought I remembered this movie wrong. And I didn't remember it wrong. They have just been color correcting over the years on what the movie looks like. So this is what the movie currently looks like. Let me show you guys. This on the top was the movie I remember. And this color palette speaks so much more to me than this bottom one because of how subdued they are. But in actuality, they're still very saturated. Now, it's very easy to say, well, compared to the bottom one, these colors seem very almost dead. It's like you took the color out. But if we color pick, let's say from Belle's gown in the light area, you can see it's actually like 75% saturated still. It's just when compared to this yellow dress on the very bottom where it's like 95% and all the way up on the value scale, yeah, there's some contrast going on. Now, personally, I much rather prefer the top one. I don't know how you guys feel about this. And like I said, color is relative, but I want to have a discussion with you. I much prefer the top one. And when I color picked from the three of them, why thank you, Gregorius Geo, for following. So when I color picked from each of them, you can see how Belle's gown alone went from this very rich, subdued, orange, almost like, a light brown color palette to a very in-your-face yellow, very um, basic, almost like the primary yellow color. 
Now that's not to say that it's wrong. You've, I, I've seen a lot of color palettes where they use the primary colors, but they use it in such a smart way that it, it really amplifies the color. But here, I feel like it, it takes away some of the, the seriousness. It almost becomes cartoony, lighthearted, where the older one, it feels a little bit darker, a, mo a little bit more mature. And a lot of that has to do with the colors that they're using because the scene in the frame is exactly the same. Only the colors and the way that they're color correcting it are different. So I'm, I'm curious if you guys have a preference. So if you could put in the comments what one you think looks better. Now, the other thing I wanna point out though is even with the Beast's blue jacket that he's wearing, you can see if we color pick on the older version, you can see on my Chloris, I'm gonna make it bigger so it's easier for you guys to see. It is still very saturated. I mean, this is the 75% range here, cause straight up and down. Uh, for those of you who don't know on this type of color wheel, saturation is based from left to right horizontally, left being all the way at zero saturation and right being all the way at 100% saturation. So when I color pick and on the jacket, it's still at a 75% saturation. That's still very saturated. It just, it looks so desaturated in contrast to the ones below it. And the reason I love the VHS one as well is because the colors just seem to be working much better together. Where on the bottom, it feels like they're fighting for attention and the background almost steals the show because in the older version, you almost have this dark gradient going up and it makes the characters in the foreground pop. And you might be wondering, well, why are we even discussing this? Because when you're doing your own illustrations, this is something to think about while doing your illustration and how to make certain things pop out. And in this case, it's very easy to make a foreground element stand out more when it's against a darker contrasted value. Where in the new version, there's so little contrast that they almost like amped up the yellow to give it more of a hue contrast. But in my opinion, it's not working as well. Now, even with the coat, you can see how it, it jumps from this on our Chloris wheel to this. So they amped up the saturation and the lightness, and that's why we're getting somewhat of this result. Now, moving forward, because I think a lot of movies do this where they intentionally make it oversaturated or very colorful. And uh, you especially see it with animated film. Now, I feel like animation films in the last 10 years have really dug in on having um, storyboards where they really focus on the colors that they're choosing to help influence the emotion that they're trying to depict on the screen. And you see it with Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks, all of them. And it's gotten to the point where they've gotten so good that it's easy to think that a movie is well crafted or it's a good movie when the story might be really bad but you're able to like give it such a nice polish that it's like you're willing to forgive some of the story errors or some of the character development flaws now a good example would be pixar's up it has in just the opening sequence alone it has a lot of color shifting going on and i think the best example is when the couple has they just find out that she is pregnant and it goes from them painting a baby's room and it's very bright it's very colorful even the clothes that they're wearing kind of match that decor and then immediately it transitions into them at the doctor's office where everything the entire palette is almost grayscaled and all the colors are just taken out and even they the the characters themselves seem muted and it's when they find out that it the the baby passed and it was a miscarriage and it was such a contrast of color and emotion in one single swipe. It was like within four seconds of each other, the moods like shift a complete 180. And they did it so well because of the, well, one, just because I think that movie, they did it, the opening scene perfectly. But the way that they utilize colors in that shift alone was, was very smart. And I, I give a lot of credit to Pixar for that scene. 
Now, moving forward, uh, the reason that we're even in this discussion today is because I watched A Cure for Wellness yesterday. Now, for those of you who don't know it, it is the new film by Gore Verbinski. He did The Ring and the first three Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and he did, what else did he do? Rango. And uh, this was kind of his return to doing more of an original film, and it had a very eerie feel. Now, The Ring, I thought, was very good with its pacing and making you feel creeped out the entire time. And that color palette, when you think of The Ring, if you guys have seen it, it has a very, like, blue, black, and it has a very, that, that whole feel of the movie feels in that range of colors. It's like a light blue, almost like a dark gray, and a black. And there's a lot of color correction going on throughout that movie, but it's done intentionally. He's not just desaturating things. Um, by accident. Now, A Cure for Wellness, for me, had a very wonderful color palette. It's actually one of the best I've seen in a year or two. And I think part of the reason that this this movie uh, was so strong for me, because I felt as a story in the characters, it was actually pretty sloppy, and I, d I didn't think they really explained things well. But the color palette kept me so intrigued. I was, every every frame to me was wonderfully crafted and a lot of it had to do with its color palette now whenever you think of a movie that has a great color palette you should be able to just put the movie title and then color after it and you should get a very easy general sense of what that color palette is on the first page of a google search now obviously a cure for wellness has this very eerie minty kind of seafoam green color palette going on and then anytime they introduced a different color like in this scene those red ball, red and green balls stand out so aggressively and the rest of the movie has uh, such a similar palette that whenever they introduce new colors, it's so intriguing for the eye. And that's when I know a film has done its job, or at least the people behind the set design and the people specifically looking at color, because then it, evo it really does evoke emotion just through showing color. And I'm sure a bunch of you can think of, on top of your head, movies that do the same thing. Uh, the first ones that came to mind when I was thinking about it was The Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson. Uh, my, one of my favorite movies of all time, it's called The Fall by Tarsum. I would definitely recommend checking that movie out. And that's like a plethora of colors. But uh, more specifically on colors that really are contained to more of a palette, I would say Grand Budapest did a great job. Um, Amelie, the French movie... I feel like has that very warm green and orange feeling to it. And if a movie can really be memorable just on the color palette, that's something uh, to be, there's something to be said there. And even with uh, action movies, oftentimes it gets kind of, uh, they blend, they bleed into each other a little too often. And uh, especially now that it seems like the movie poster, um, the people that create movie posters have kind of found the, the golden trick with the blue and the orange uh, complementary colors on their posters. It, it works, but I feel like oftentimes it becomes cliche. And then other times you see it work so spectacularly well because it's like a shift. It's a, just a small shift. You've, you can think of like a movie such as Mad Max. It wasn't pure blue. It was almost like a green blue. And it wasn't pure orange. It was like a very goldenrod yellow uh, orange. It was like a mix between. And that color combination spoke so strong in that movie. Well, thank you, Lost Re, for following. That I believe that's why it, uh, that movie stood out on a color palette sense. And then whenever you see different colors introduced, it's so foreign. When they introduce the green foliage, and if you guys haven't seen it, I don't feel like I'm spoiling anything. But whenever you see different color palettes introduced, it's almost refreshing. And I like when movies contain their color palettes and they're really observant about what colors they're using. All right, anyways, uh, sometimes I can get a little ranty and I, I just start talking and rambling. So if you guys feel I am doing that, I, am, I apologize in advance. Um, oh, yeah, you guys are putting a lot of comments here. Let me... I'm going to just do a quick look over some of these and uh, see which ones I definitely agree with. Uh, Christy McVie, I definitely agree with a Finding Nemo. I feel like it was very 
it had that same complimentary palette. It was very blue, and then they chose a clownfish, orange, to be their main character. Thank you, Maggie Penia, for following. And I can promise you that was not accidental that they did that choice. If they had... Um, well, and it was funny because then their secondary character, Dory, is very blue. And often, and you know, you see in the movie, sometimes Dory kind of blends in with the background. But Marvin, the main clownfish, he always pops against that ocean water, which was very smart. Uh, True Cat Lord says Coraline was a good one for a lot of color. Now, with animated movies, the one thing that I think... Uh, can get distracting is since they are working with animation and 3D modeling, uh, I feel like color is very editable or not. I don't know if that's a word. It's very easy to add a lot of color, a lot of saturation. And I think animation movies try to have every color palette in their movies. So like when it's happy, they definitely have like the happy palette. When it's sad, they have a sad palette. When it's supposed to be like action, they have an action palette. And I kind of see this being recycled through animation movies and I mean mind you I still respect them a lot but then you watch an animated movie or a stop motion movie like let's say Fantastic Mr. Fox which has a very contained palette and even though they have different scenes with different palettes to evoke emotion it's not that cookie cutter palette that it seems like a lot of animation movies are using nowadays or even like way back in the day with Don Bluth films they had very dark, uh, almost savage colors and palettes that they use for the entire films. But in terms of more modern ones, I would say Fantastic Mr. Fox did a good job. Or even like when you think of Nightmare Before Christmas, they had a very muted color palette. And then as soon as Jack goes into the other worlds, all of a sudden this color is like a breath of fresh air. It's so refreshing. And it, it really adds that contrast to the world that he used to live in. So then when they cut back to the Halloween town, there's such a, a, a mood different and like a shift in um, the mood that you feel. So let's see what other ones we got here. Uh, Gypsy says Across the Universe. I love Across the Universe. We were just having a discussion about this the other day. Uh, they kind of have a thing where they throw all the colors in the movie. So it's not as much of a contained palette, but I still love Across the Universe and what they did. Uh, with that movie. Um, just everything David Lynch does, I definitely agree with that. And the Royal Tenenbaums. I feel like Wes Anderson definitely understands how to work with a palette and how to use it to his advantage. So any Wes Anderson film, I would definitely recommend for a color uh, palette uh, referencing. And especially his newer ones, especially like Moonrise Kingdom even. It had this very earthy feel, but it was like a muted earthy feel. And then he had like pops of yellow uh, that really stood out. Uh, Christy says, Ava's Demon. I need to check that out. I'm actually not familiar with that one. Um, I Am Not says, Hero is my favorite movie. Actually, Hero is one of the ones I wrote down. Hero is known for their storytelling ability through the color palette that they use. And it's it's very blunt. It's not like they're trying to be subtle with the colors that they're using. If any of you have seen Hero, they know what they're doing with their color palette. And they like embellished they go over the top with it to really hit home that emotion that they're doing and i feel like oftentimes that wouldn't work but with hero i feel like it does uh, work very well um cmh39 says i go to the university of do it yourself and my instructor sucks at picking colors he usually just throws neon light all over the place um I do feel like neon colors have their place. Uh, if you watch movies like Drive or The Neon Demon or anything that has like an 80s retro Miami Vice feel, you definitely can use neon colors to your advantage, and I feel like you can hit a really strong palette. But I personally think working with a more subdued or muted color palette first and then like having pops of saturation can be a better route to go because if you go all saturated, I feel that it becomes harder to direct the focus to where you want it to go for the viewer, unless if you're adding a lot of value contrast. And I feel like you can't just rely on value contrast all the time. And this is something I talk about in the color course. You have to rely on hue contrast, saturation contrast, and value contrast. Just relying on how bright it is to give your contrast, I feel like is taking the easy way out and you're not really mastering 
uh, how to direct the viewer to where you want them to. Uh, I think that's something that you learn through experimentation and just by understanding color more. And then you might be thinking, well, Tim, isn't that a lot of extra work I have to go through to make my compositions look great? Well, if anything, you should see it as another opportunity to heighten and enhance your paintings to another level. And whenever I learn something new, I get so excited because then I feel like I can make my paintings from that point forward look even better and better. So I'm hoping with what we're talking about today, with you guys moving forward, if you do a lot of illustration work, um, I hope you learn something. And rather than it discourage you, I hope this inspires you. And for your next piece, you really drive home a lot of the points we talk about or maybe experiment with what we talk about on the stream today. Okay, let me see. Let me read off some of the other ones that you guys throw out at me, and then I'll, I'll actually start painting something here. Uh, Tijo says, Life of Pi. That definitely had a very, um, a very specific color palette. I feel like they definitely had more of that animation color palette that I was talking about. Uh, Mad Max, absolutely. I think Fury Road is one of those perfect movies as an action movie. I mean, not. Every, I feel like every movie can get a critique on some level. I feel like some of the opening sequences in Mad Max with the flashbacks, it, it didn't really work for me as much. But as a whole, I feel like that movie is a perfect uh, gem. And I think if you guys haven't seen Fury Road, I think you should. Uh, C. Drifter says, wouldn't it be cool to take a movie like Night Before Christmas and change the colors around and see how they change the mood of the, of the movie? Absolutely. Imagine if Jack Skellington was like a blood red skeleton the entire time in this like grayscale world. Or imagine if he was like a very bright, or not bright, let's say a very saturated warm yellow. Like his entire outfit, his the skull and his black and white wardrobe. Imagine if it was yellow and red or something very carnivalesque. That would change the entire perception and, and mood of that character just from the colors that you're laying on top of them. Uh, Jensen says, me too, currently learning light and I'm so excited to keep painting. That's awesome. I, I hope that you uh, keep experimenting with color and light, Jensen, because you have the patience and attention, attention to detail and I feel like just continuing with understanding light and color will just make your pieces better and better and better. Uh, Art of Wubbles and says, oh, yes, if you want to ask me a question, please put at CG Cookie Concept before it. That way I can read it really quick while I'm going through the questions here. Uh, Tigel says V for Vendetta. Absolutely. When I think of V for Vendetta, black, red, white. Those are like the three colors that instantly come to my mind. And that's another one of those perfect, I would, I would put that in my perfect movie category. While it, there's still things that you can critique on it and edit, as a whole, the movie to me is a perfect entertainment experience on all levels of acting, the visual side, the writing, and uh, directing. So that would be one of them. And I feel like I could have a whole day where I could just talk about my favorite movies, but I'm not going to do that because I want to keep focused on the topic at hand here. Um, and you, the last thing I want to talk about before I paint is while we're talking about color, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be this bold, bright, warm, cool color palette. As another example, if any of you guys have seen Black Swan, a lot of her wardrobe starting off is almost white. It's like a gray color palette. And uh, it's supposed to represent something deeper. Now, if you guys are like me, I really like digging into a film and the choices that are made with the characters, their wardrobes, the set design, cinematography, like everything. I, I love it. I think film is so interesting. So for the character, she starts off very pure and innocent, and <coughs> it's represented by the color. And throughout the movie, you see her, her wardrobe slightly getting darker. And halfway through, it's almost like this gray scale color. And it's in the sweatpants that she's wearing. It's very subtle. Like, it's one of those things that you probably wouldn't notice unless if you're actively paying attention to the wardrobe and what that means for the character. Because before Black Swan, uh, I guess wardrobe was always one of those things that where I kind of paid attention to on, like, uh, wow, that's very, that's a very beautiful wardrobe, you know. It was very easy to distinguish that, but it never occurred to me how much the choices behind the color could mean for the character that they're um, telling as a story. So even with this character, she, she becomes darker. And the whole thing is about becoming either a white or a black swan. She's very good at being a white swan, but she, she needs to learn how to become the black swan. 
and by the end of the movie, she's wearing a lot of darks. This represents not only her transformation into learning to become the Black Swan, but maybe her transforming and maturing as a person. And the fact that it's reflected in the wardrobe, it's such a smart choice, and it's one of those little details that you would miss if you weren't paying attention to it. So don't think that all this color talk means you have to go big and colorful, and you really have to have uh, a lot of colors to evoke, invoke this emotion. You can do something with simply zero hues involved whatsoever and it can still be just as strong and powerful as a statement okay so let's see what is the next thing i want to talk about here okay yeah so when film first started it was in the silent film area they figured out a way to add color to their film by individually putting paint on each of the frames. If you can imagine doing that back in the day, that had to be like one of the worst jobs, honestly. But they did so to evoke more of this fantastical realm. And let me see if I still have, I had a tab open. Ah, I do, okay. So in this case, I'll mute it though. It starts off very grayscale. And then as soon as I add color, all of a sudden, this becomes interesting. There's something happening that interests our eye. And before it was all grayscale, but when you add color, all of a sudden, it entered more of this fantastical realm. And they did this throughout a lot of film, um, especially back in the day. Oops. And even with uh, this one, they color framed it, but they would gradient from color to color. And you can see how, well, one, how painstakingly that must have been to do each frame. But the fact that they were like exploring color and what that meant for film back in the day when you couldn't record color. And then obviously when film started introducing color, that's when it became a lot easier to not have to edit every single frame. And I think the best example or the most well-known one is Wizard of Oz where she starts in the grayscale Kansas and then uh, enters the, the land of Oz and it's all colorful and it's very saturated and it's almost like over the top lush colors to really uh, it, to show the difference. Why thank you sacred brain candy for following. So the reason that I love old film, especially with the silent film area is you can see with their colors, it's almost like, I, I personally love it because they are like intentionally making it over colorful, but look at that contrast. This, this frame, especially here with the women in the mint swimsuits, waving their very bold yellow hats. To me, that feels like a Wes Anderson film nowadays. And I feel like when people are very attentive to the colors that they're choosing, they choose colors that are bold, that are effective. And in this case, I think this works so well. Now, some of the other ones, I think they were just trying to throw more of an interest, a visual intrigue, if you will, in the frame, where they don't make as much sense. But that color combination is so unique because it was so exploratory. And that's why even my roommate, uh, Ki, who goes online as Gawky, she has such a great understanding of color because she is willing to explore. She has no fear of throwing down colors editing them, rehashing them, and keep going through a process where you're taking colors out, you're adding colors, you're throwing down saturation, you're mixing different hue shifts, and then you cr you eventually you come up with something where you're like, wow, I, I really like where this ended up. Where a lot of us, I feel, have this set notion where before we even start the painting, we have to have a color palette in mind, and we we have to stick to that color because when we when we paint blue jeans they have to be blue where i want you guys to throw that notion like so far out the door that you can't even see where it landed because working with color the more fantastical you get the more original you start to treat your color palette i feel like the more that you'll stand out as an artist and the more you'll learn because obviously you can't just throw a bunch of random colors together and just because it's different it's better that's not how it works. It was like uh, I saw a picture the other day that had a hammer, but it had the wood part as the mallet and then the 
handle was the metal. And it was like, just because you're unique doesn't mean you're useful. And I really like that because yeah, color is best when you're exploring it and you're doing kind of these different combinations, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be good in the outcome. Instead, it means that you're willing to give other palettes a try to evoke a different sense of emotion. Now, one of the colors that, or one of the examples that I wanted to show you guys, let's see here, I'm going to switch this over. Was uh, doing a pick. So when you guys think of painting a pig, I bet immediately you guys think of doing uh, pinks or something that would kind of look more like a pig. So I'm going to go ahead and start painting a pig the way that we would more on a realistic level. And actually, you know what? I'm going to even pull in... Re oh, no, you know what? I'm not going to pull in reference. I'm going to do uh, eye picking where you kind of look at the picture and you try to pick it on your own color palette. Because as much as I think color picking is useful and you learn a lot from it, I think you learn a lot more when you have to literally pick it out for yourself on the color wheel and see, okay, where is that color? Where do I think that color would be? Probably around here. Then you start painting. And then when you compare, you color pick from the picture and then you color pick from the painting that you've done, how similar your color selection was and how close were you at eyeing the color that you're trying to uh, recreate here. Okay. So I'm gonna start off this, this little pig. So now immediately we're thinking more of like the subdued kind of uh, Caucasian color mixed with, we're gonna add some pinks here in a second. So let's see, let's color pick. Let's go a little more pink. Lay that on the nose, inside the ears there. And even now I can tell, and if you guys don't know how I usually paint, I usually go from dark to light. That's why I'm starting this one off a little darker. And even as I say darker, it only looks so dark because we're working on a white background. So this is why I recommend working on a grayscale background because then your colors are more true and you're not being influenced by the relative color on the background. And you know what, and then I'm gonna go a little lighter. Just for the top of the head, just to give it some implied lighting direction. I'm gonna do a quick blend in. Uh, question from Gatekeeper01, what's that color picker? It's not the default one. No, this is the Coloris color tool. I have a tutorial on how to use it and what the settings on it are. This one you do actually have to pay for, but uh, they reached out to me for our last contest and I've always known about the Coloris color wheel, but I always used the one that came standard in Photoshop. But I have to say, after using this now for a little while, I really, really enjoy working with it. I don't find it absolutely necessary, but as someone that loves working with color, having this uh, wheel on the side where you can quickly choose between uh, the color schemes or if you want to see it 
where if like you want to limit the color palette that you have, it's very easy to do so in this colorist tool. And that's why I like working with it. All right, then let's make the eyes dark. Because pigs tend to have very dark eyes. And inside their snout. So this would probably be more of a general look at how we would color a pig. And if we wanted to get more, let's say, I don't want to use the word experimental, but we'll say if you started working with other colors to introduce, yellow would be a very safe one. And you could get even more saturated for like the ears if you want. And we get a very warm, nice feeling with this pig, which is great. But let's say we wanted to evoke a different emotion other than just realism. Because even the yellow, with the addition of it, it still kind of evokes more of a realistic look. And thank you. Sl oh, I missed it. But thank you for following it. I think it was Sl Sylvia. Sorry for missing that. Um, so I did a little paint over before this started. So imagine if this was our first stab at drawing the pig. And let's look at the difference when it looks something like this. So immediately, hopefully, there was a different reaction to when you saw this. Now this is actually based off of a painting that I found online. So this isn't like my original uh, color palette here. But when I was searching for something, this immediately evoked a different emotion than when looking at a normal painting of a pig. To me, all of a sudden I get more of like a sickly and uneasy feeling. And that could be because of the greens that were introduced here. And usually when looking at green with flesh tone, oftentimes that means ill or sick. And with this pig, when you mix the ill and sick feeling that's like hinted with this very blunt, almost like gory red blood color uh, on the snout and in the ears, now we're really getting into this almost uneasy, gross feeling and like it's bordering on like a horror genre. You're not exactly sure what we're getting into here, but you can definitely tell this evokes a different emotion than something like this. Now, actually, as I'm looking at this, let me go ahead and just bump up those colors and then we'll do a side by side. So right now these are very light colors. There we go. Look at that. Look at that happy pig. Now, mind you, I'm not saying that this color palette is wrong. There are things that I like with this color palette, if I was completely honest with you. But this color palette definitely rings a different emotion up. Let me make this a little smaller here. Then this color palette. Still the same subject matter, still the same line art that we, we started with, but the one on the left definitely evokes a different emotion than the one on the right. And this kind of goes back to the hand that I used as the example drawing uh, for the stream. From just changing up the color palette, it evokes a completely different emotion. Now the last one that, or not the last one, but the next example that I'm going to do is one that I, I get often distracted by in movies, and it's the color of blood. Now, red for, the, for a very long time has been my favorite color. I feel like it's slowly shifting to yellow or gray. I just feel like that's where maybe I'm, I'm at in my life right now. But for a very long time, it was red. So I'm going to give you two examples of what I see in film and how I think they are perceived. And while I'm doing that, let me look at what you guys are saying in the comments here. Uh, mean Machine Rex says, Tim, can you give me some advice on my coloring? If you post what you want me to look at in the community post for this Twitch stream, I can definitely take a look at it. And I'm also going to be posting some of my favorite color movies on that community post. So if you guys are interested in hearing or uh, watching some of the movies that I would recommend for kind of intriguing your color palette in your mind, uh, I'm going to be posting a few of them on that community post. Uh, Gatekeeper says, does color affect communication across all people or do films like Finding Nemo work better in America just on the color alone? This is a great question. I think in the States, there's 
certain things that we've established that works. And oftentimes with big business, when it comes anything to do with money and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, no, I would say unfortunately, the film industry is still a business. So a lot of the times investors and producers are looking to make a buck back on their investment and by getting their buck, by, by wanting their money back and then some, they usually want the animation studios or the films that they're investing in to do what they know already works. And this is why you see a lot of the movies with having kind of the same formula and kind of the same look to them being made over and over again. And that's why people say we're going through this uh, superhero uh, movement right now in film where, yeah, people complain about how they, well, I don't, I don't think everyone complains. I feel like I'm in the minority with the friend group that I have. But a lot of times it's like, we've seen this before. Like it's just the same thing regurgitated over and over again. But it makes a lot of money, so that's why you see films that are uh, similar to those being produced over and over and over again. And oftentimes movies that take more risks or that are different, they aren't, they don't do as well commercially. And uh, because of that, financially, they don't get the return for their investors and you don't see a lot of them made unless if they're self-produced. Usually you, you may see directors make a lot of money off of blockbusters and then kind of do their own film, do one that is more of like a personal uh, piece. And as an example, like Miyazaki, he did a lot of these movies. Now, I think they're all very wonderful, especially his earlier ones, like Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle and Princess Mononoke, and even Nausicaa or Castle in the Sky. Like a lot of those I find so incredibly inspiring and great. But then as his last film, uh, the one The Wind Rises, he did that for himself. And if it was received well by others, it didn't matter to him because he did that for himself. And you see movie directors do that where often when they make a lot of money and they've kind of established themselves as a director, then they have a lot more creative limit, uh, freedom to do what they want. Um, and that's where you get a lot of these weird movies. And that's why A Cure for Wellness, when I watched it last night, yeah, do I think it was kind of sloppy and do I think the story needed a bit of help or some rewrites going in on there? Absolutely. Do I think the movie was beautiful and I think stands as one of those movies that will probably end up as like a cult classic film? Absolutely. And Gore Verbinski made a lot of money off those Pirates of the Caribbean movies. So I think this was just him going more to the artistic side and exploring something there. So with artsy movies, they might not always be the best. I personally love them. And I, anytime I hear a weird movie, I want to watch it because usually they're, they're limitless. There's a lot more freedom in it. And usually I'll see something that I've never seen before. And, uh, I guess for examples, think of like the Holy mountain or enter the void or the warm color of your tears or the strange color of your tears. I think it was called, um, a lot of those type of movies that are very art oriented, those are the ones that I really get intrigued by. Or what was the one I watched? Uh, Holy Rollers. That's another one of those. Or anything by Hodorowski. I am so intrigued by movies that try something different. And I, sorry, I feel like I'm going on another tangent here, but uh, I wanted to explain it better. Okay, so now blood. This is something that oftentimes we see in movies, especially that have action or any type of fighting maybe it's like there for a second like someone accidentally cuts himself I'm gonna do two really quick versions of what I see in cinema Because I find one to be very distracting. <laughs> and I bet you'll be able to figure it out pretty quick. Okay, so I'm going to quickly add a little highlight here. So now... In movies, these are the two types of blood that I usually see. The first one being almost comical or uh, ketchup looking. And the second one being very rich, very dark. And 
to me, when I see blood that is like pretty much black with like hints of subtle red along the edges and has like a, that pop of a highlight, this evokes so much more, oops. This evokes so much more emotion and range than the first one. This almost brings up a different emotion, almost silly or, and it's funny saying that about blood, but it doesn't evoke quite the same richness and deepness that the second one does. And you see this a lot with color palettes that aren't working as much as they could. And I think blood is like the easiest example because I find it so distracting when the blood almost comes out like an orange color, like a vivid neon color. And it just, it takes me out for a second. But then when it's very dark and rich and it feels real, I feel like that that hits something more because then it, the feeling, there's empathy. You, you see the blood and it almost feels real where when it comes out as like this bright red, almost like kid's color, it doesn't quite hit that same emotion within you. And like I said, color is at the beginning, color is relative. So maybe for you, this one reads more true. And when you see this, this is distracting. That's the other beautiful thing about color. It, it's different for every single person. Okay, let me see what you guys are asking here. Uh, Tishel says, it's like Beauty and the Beast in the original in the first scenes. Belle is the only one in the village wearing blue, so she would stand out. And she'll, so she would seem pure, unique, and beautiful. Yeah, that's a very good example. Uh, Miss Chibi, Chibi Artist says, I find that some artists have a signature color palette. Uh, Lin Yan comes to mind if you've seen her work. I have. Do you think artists should be very diverse with color? Yeah, absolutely. I think even though, even the artists that I respect and love the most that work with color, they still have a range of color. Think of like a very popular one, like Loesch. Loesch is very known for the way that she colors and she has very beautiful, rich colors. But when you look at her pieces, they all kind of have different colors within them. But if I would think of Loesch at the top of my head, I would say blue comes to mind. Let me Google her and see what uh, are the first few images that come up. See, even, yeah, there's a lot of blue, but then look at all the other colors. Actually, now that I'm looking at, there's like blue in every single one of these. But that's good. That means that there's an underlying color that she n uses in most of her pieces. Like this one, there's no blue in this one. So yeah, I think it's great to explore with color. And just because you get comfortable with a specific palette, doesn't mean that that's the only palette you should ever use. If anything, that should almost encourage you and uh, remind you that you understand color and you found something that works really well because you went on that path of exploring color, but you got to keep doing it. Otherwise, you're getting comfortable. And when you get familiar with com uh, being comfortable, that's when you don't grow as an artist. So it's an ever-going, ongoing process of becoming better as an artist. So... Do I feel like personally I've found palettes that worked in the past for me? Yes. Do I feel like sometimes I rely on them like a crutch? Absolutely. Do I also understand that if I need to grow as an artist, I need to change that up? Yes. So yeah, I think it's good when colors find color palettes that work for them and maybe they have like a gallery or a set number of pieces that they want to work with that palette. But I think then moving forward, they need to grow further from that. Another good example would be Danny Diaz. If you guys know who he is, or if you don't know who he is, please check him out. I'm going to put his name in the comment section. He is a fantastic artist. He's actually one of my favorites now, just because of his exploration and his freedom in his work, I find inspiring. And his latest character cast that he's doing, it has a lot of these almost neon colors. There's a lot of like pink and this turquoise blue and... Uh, the way that he's working with the character proportions is very inspiring. But then if you scroll on his Instagram like two pages down, it's a completely different palette. It's a completely different character style. You go two more pages down, and then you get into his Inktober stuff where he doesn't even have color included. And the way that he's working with his proportions and values on that is completely different than the character palette that he's working with now. So he's one of those artists that I feel like are growing because of the way that they're experimenting and they're not just relying on what they know already works. So he's someone I would definitely check out. Let me see what else you guys are saying. 
Uh, True Cat Lord says, something I learned from my friend when, I, when they were 11 was, bruises are more than just blue and red. And that really stuck with me. I think that statement single-handedly changed how I think about color. That's great. Yeah. When, well, I guess the first thing that does come to mind when you think bruises is that purple, that like rich purple kind of red color. But then when you look at reference images on Google, oftentimes bruises can be very weird green and yellow colors included as well. And it's the idea that don't just rely on the first color thought that comes to mind when you want to recreate something. Try to dig deeper or even go the opposite route. Whatever color normally you would think of, do the opposite color and make it work. Like challenge yourself in your pieces and you may surprise yourself with the outcome. Gatekeeper01 says, what's that color picker you... Or no, I think I answered that. Yeah, so this is the Coloris color picker. You can uh, download this online. Gypsy Hummingbird says, makes me think of an animal farm. Oh, I think you, this was talking about the, the pig. Uh, Gypsy Hummingbird says, Wrecking for a Dream and Blade Runner are another two I really like. Wrecking for a Dream, we were just talking about this the other night, uh, is one of those movies you don't want to watch more than once, really. It is so powerful, and it actually makes me sick. I feel ill after watching that movie. And a lot of that has to do with the, the music that they're working with in that movie. And I, I think it's a very strong movie. Aronofsky is actually one of my favorite directors, if not my favorite director. I thought Noah was kind of a miss, but all of his other films I feel like nailed it, uh, especially with Black Swan and even The Wrestler, which is a more lesser known one, but I felt like that did a great job at capturing uh, the emotion and what they were trying to say. Uh, anyways, but with Wrecking for a Dream, I feel like uh, that was sound design. I feel like that's what made that film so powerful in the way that it was shot with like those close-ups with like the iris and the or the pupil enlarging and the quick shots of the uh, liquid going through the syringes, the pills. Um, but their color palette was, I would say, more muted. And then in the scenes that were more frantic, they had like vi vi very vibrant colors kind of flashing at you, especially with like the girl at that party, we'll just say, or when the, the guy's going through his drug trip. Uh, there's a lot of flashing colors, and since the rest of the movie was more muted, uh, you see the contrast there. Or the other thing that we can talk about in that movie was the mom, who slowly becomes addicted to the weight loss pills. And when she starts, her hair is... Uh, I, you know what, maybe I'll just pull up a reference here. Because you see a change in her hair, in her wardrobe... And I'm talking specifically about the color. Okay, without spoiling, spoiling it, let me find good references. So when the movie first starts off, she has... I'm going to just slowly slide these on one by one. So she has this very kind of tame, you know, mom, grandma hair, where it's uh, this light brown, it's curly. But then as she as the movie progresses and she's taking these diet pills, she dyes her hair this vivid red color. Now, this was no accident that they chose red, and what they do from this point forward, let me grab the image here. Right there. So she dyes her hair red, and then from that movie on, or from that point forward, as she becomes more addicted to the drugs and as... Uh, she kind of slowly starts losing her mind. She also slowly starts losing the color in her hair. And the hair almost re represented her sanity. And then as she's going through it, you can see it becomes very faded and she has the gray hair starting to poke out. And then let me find you guys. If you guys haven't seen this, I would just look away for a minute. I'm going to do a spoiler really quick. In three, two, one. Um, by the end of the movie, the mom is in a relapse facility, or not a relapse facility, in a hospital, and her hair is completely cut off except for the gray, very light silver hair that has grown back in. And her, her life is just gone. And I like that, uh, the comparison between um, when people have, when people are very colorful and when they become depressed or something happens to them, that color fades. And in this sense, it's a very literal interpretation where her hair literally has no color. And you can see the transition through the movie of it being this very bright color. 
Uh, even with her wardrobe, they, they try to have her in these more bright colors. And then by the end, she's wearing this hospital smock that is this very uh, desaturated blue and with gray, uh, very white hair. So that is a great example of using color as an advantage to telling a story behind a character without having to say anything. And those are the type of movies that you need to be watching to get inspired by uh, working with color on a deeper level. Because those are the ones that kind of will take storytelling and make it so much richer and so much deeper than just the surface level of what the characters are saying out of their mouths. Okay, let me... And the second one was Blade Runner. I feel like I honestly have to watch it again just because the first time I watched it, I was drawing and I feel like I didn't get the experience that I probably should. And especially since that's, that is such a classic in the sci-fi genre, I will give it another try. Uh, I did like it though. I, I, may, I shouldn't make it sound like I didn't like it. I did like it. I, I should watch it again. Okay. Let's see here. There was one other thing that I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah. So then even with our... Uh, promo image for this stream here this hand we did a couple of streams back and originally it was just supposed to be a demonstration on how to shade uh, the hand and then we did a quick color correction on the one that you see on the left here and this blue one came up and I found it very intriguing and even on the stream you probably see me kind of go through like whoa like what what's happening here and that's because my mind is racing with how this is making me feel and what emotions are being evoked from this hand and originally I thought it would make it look dead, but now this hand doesn't necessarily remind me of just dead. I feel something different from it, and it's just this very cool, very, um, it's almost like something bad happened. Where the first one, it's so warm and vibrant, and this is this, the hand that we're probably most familiar with, and the one that we probably would paint if we were going to draw a character, if you're going to draw a Caucasian character. But then the blue one, it takes a little bit more of when you look at it it takes more to kind of let it soak in and really decipher why are these colors chosen why did the artist decide to have these colors represent a hand and that's why this was the image to kind of represent the stream today Doo -doo -doo. okay now that is most so i know we we've burned about an hour already and that was the the, a good blunt of what I wanted to talk about today, so I'm glad I, I was able to say that. And the last thing, uh, even with these hands, are the idea between warm and cool. A warm color palette will typically invoke different motions than a cooler color palette. And I think this one's very obvious, and I think this is the one that is used in animation more, where happy times or new, or if you're setting off on an adventure, usually you get more warm colors. You get uh, the sunrise or a sunset, depending on the the story and it's supposed to invoke more of like inspiring hope where cool colors can typically do the opposite where it's sad something depressing happened uh death um and that would be like the very surface the next level down would be when warm colors can be used to look at something that is more traumatic or maybe a bit more aggressive think of the color red I think red is a perfect example of where you can have a spectrum of emotions in a single color because from what I've learned, red does uh, hit us the most um, in terms of the spectrum of colors. Red is the one that uh, evokes something the most. And red can be extremely violent and aggressive. And at the opposite end, it can be very passionate and loving. And uh, while some would say that these are very two very different emotions with love and like gore or blood or something that's uh, action and fighting they both to me represent passion so whenever i see red there's a very distinctive association i have with red when i see it in film and uh, the same could be said about other colors but the trick is when you can use a color that is typically associated with one emotion and have it kind of flip and have it represent the opposite so a good example would be in Kill Bill, if you guys are familiar. Let me pull up an example. Uh, Uma Thurman wears a, a striking yellow, and it has become iconic, uh, tracksuit. And 
yellow for most people are very like happy, simple, uh, joy, hope. Usually hope is the one that is the color described. It would be this one here. But in the movie, uh, is this very aggressive yellow color as she's like making her way and she's cutting people left and right. Uh, yellow almost becomes like this terrifying color. Think of like a bee or a hornet. All of a sudden, the association with yellow isn't so much joyful and hopeful, but it's dangerous. And I think that's why the yellow tracksuit was such a smart decision in that movie. I don't know who, if that was Tarantino that made that decision, but whoever was behind that decision, I think very smart. And that suit has now become very iconic. So when working with colors, try your best to, when you're color picking, try your best to look outside of the box and decide what does this color normally, what do I normally associate this color with and how can I possibly do something different with it? And this hands was a good example of where, how can I use blue and purple to show a live hand? Or even with our pigs here, how can I use green to depict a pig? And I guess a good challenge would be, how can I use the color green and make the, the subject matter look healthy if you're doing a character? That would be very challenging. And it would be very easy to make something look healthy if you use like pink or red. And having that contrast of color would be um, a, a challenge, definitely. Okay, so that was mostly what I want to discuss with you guys today. I know I've been rambling for like an hour straight. So if you guys have any questions, please put them in the comments. And I think I might just freehand paint for the next 40 minutes. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask you guys was what movies, when you think of them, stand out in your mind as being very color heavy influenced? And I would like to know so that I can, one, I can uh, watch them because I find films to be so uh, inspiring in my own life. But also I'll share some with you as well that I found very inspiring. Um, not... I am not says if you are designing a character and you're trying multiple designs, how do you pick the one? Uh, if you like more than one and they fit the character, that's a great question. Uh, if you are working with color and you've gotten to a point where you kind of understand color on another level, this can become very difficult. Oops. Uh, it can be very difficult to choose between one or the other. It's not that one's better than the other, but possibly one has uh, a strength in a different area. Maybe it has more of a warm palette, but it's still strong. And then one might be very strong in a cool palette. And they're like equally strong. So like which one do you choose? That's when typically you look at who the character is, what environment they're in, which one speaks more to who the character is as a person. And uh, that can still be a tough decision though. I, I honestly have gone through that tough process where I, I was battling between two very similar palettes and oftentimes that's where I'll ask for critique from someone else or like ask them what does this uh, make you feel and that's how I will typically choose it and actually even with the stream that we did last week with our our mermaid here this was a good example of when I really wanted to try something to do uh, with a mermaid that isn't blue or green. And the idea was to do something very purple and have yellow tones in there. And this, to me, was one of the most fun color pieces I've done probably in like a year just because of how open to interpretation and to experiment I was able to be. And this was the outcome, and I had a lot of fun with it. And in the end, yeah, it might be kind of weird, but... It was something that I wasn't used to trying, and I feel like I learned from doing this. So in doing pieces that you're normally not comfortable with or that aren't in your familiar territory or comfort zone, that's when you do learn. And me, just like a lot of my other art friends, oftentimes we get stuck in these ruts where we're continuing to hash out the same level of quality because it's familiar and comfortable. <laughs> but it's, it's tough to want to explore because it's frustrating. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it's not. It's frustrating and it, it can become very difficult and uh, almost like mentally draining trying to do something outside your comfort zone and work with something because of the fact that you're actively processing what you're doing. 
where when we're familiar, comfortable, we go on autopilot. We don't have to think about it. We can just sit there and render because we already know it works. So our brain can go elsewhere. It can be listening to music. It can be watching a movie. Uh, but when you're actively thinking, that's when all of a sudden all of your focus and all of your brain energy is being used to decipher what you're seeing on the screen. If it's working, if it's not, what to do next, how to fix it, how to uh, go from there. And that's why, yeah, a lot of people usually hit a comfort zone or whenever they grow, they usually plateau for a little while and then eventually they become almost bored with their work or frustrated with their work and then that's when they go back up. Thank you, Breathing Colors, for following. And usually with artists, I feel like, let me draw on a map here. So this is the starting point. It's not really like this. I mean, sometimes it is for artists. You just hope that you want the inclination to still be, you know, gradually uphill. But I feel like what I've seen, just on personal experience in the arts that I follow, my own friends, it usually goes something more like this. And the older we get, I feel like the longer the spans of time that we're plateauing are. And I do feel like there is just a little dip before we kind of make that growth up again. And actually, other times I see something like this happen. Where they're making like small growth over time. Why thank you, Mangiana, for following. Where they're still kind of reaching the same point but their growth is more sporadic and that's because they're trying different things. So even though this person at this point, the red person might be way better in the quality output that they're doing because they're resting on that for so long, the blue artist is able to catch up because he's constantly experimenting. And you see that with artists. I, I could even look at my own work, my own collection over the years and I can tell you exactly where I plateaued. And for some of them, some of those plateaus, they're like six months long or even, I, I, I never would say it's been like a year of plateau. I don't think, or I would hope not. I hope that I have enough uh, critical eye that I can look at my stuff and see how long I plateaued. But yeah, I definitely feel more of like the red artist more so than the blue. The blue would be more of like a Danny Diaz. And he is just growing, like every three months, I feel like he is growing and becoming a better artist where usually you see when people hit kind of their mid-20s, they, they plateau for longer periods of time. So this is something that I find very interesting, especially with artists that I have taught or that I have met, and especially with artists in social media where you can see what they're outputting. And over the years, you can tell some artists that you may have looked up to as a kid. Maybe let me do like, let's do another color here. Let's say they started here. Well, guess what? If they haven't grown over the years, guess where you'll be in a few years by the time uh, they're, they're at that same point? You'll also be at that same quality output because they're not putting an effort to change and try to be a better artist. They have rested on what works and they're just rehashing the same thing. Now, <laughs> this is where it becomes a little difficult because then I, I feel like you're talking about uh, how to make money as an artist and sometimes you have to rely on what works. And I feel like especially as a commercial artist, you do have to find what works and then keep pumping it out so that there is a similarity between the output that you're doing. And that way, when someone is investing in you as a freelancer, they kind of know what to expect. I am going to do a whole stream on how to make money as an artist and I'm not going to just base it on my experience. I'm going to do it on my roommates, on the friends that I've had, on the advice I've gotten over the years, because I feel like this is something that hits home for a lot of you guys and something that I could talk about uh, just as passionately as I'm talking about the subject matter today. And I know this one was more of a lecture for today, but I feel like this is something I need to get off my chest because I was so uh, inspired last night after watching this movie. So anyways... Uh, the only fear with this graph would be the final artist would be like if you started here, you may grow a little bit, but then actually over time you're not working as much. And guess what? Even though you started off higher than the blue and the red artist, in the end, 
they actually were able to surpass you because you weren't taking any necessary steps to become a better artist or better yourself in the quality that you're doing. Okay, let's see here. Uh, John Miller says, what about color around the subject and how would that affect the overall piece? That's a great uh, one too. Let me... So as an example, I'll show you one of the pieces I did that I think perfectly represents what I would want to say here. So in this piece, this is my character Nate, and actually this is the more desaturated one. Let me find, I'm gonna open up the more saturated one. Or, no, I guess this one will work for what I want to say. Okay, so this character, obviously when you first see the piece, well, maybe not obviously, but hopefully, you get the sense that something isn't right or something is a little down. Uh, and it's the idea of the colors that I'm working with, with this very green and kind of purple uh, color palette. And he just kind of looks, I mean, it's very easy to give a character's emotion by the way that they're sitting in their body posture, their body language. And in this one, it's obviously... Once again, hopefully, obviously, more melancholy. Now, yellow is usually associated with hope and life and happy. And in this painting that I did, the color yellow is outside of the windows. So it's one of those things where he is inside in this gloomy green purple area, and he's looking out outside at this color rich area, and he can see it, but he's not able to be included with it. And Maybe this could be, for some people, I have actually been told that for them, this represented depression for them because you're looking out this window and even though you can see other people being happy, you yourself feel like you cannot uh, achieve it. There's something in between you. And that interpretation was great. I didn't even think about that when I first did this painting, but I did want there to be a contrast between cool and warm and the idea that he was more in this cool color palette and the warm color palette was like right there next to him. It was like within his a vision and right there next to him, but there was a separation. There was literally a wall of separation between the two. And this is how you can use color uh, between the subject matter and your background and still have story elements behind it. And this is probably my best example. Let me look at the other ones I've done. Uh, red, not so much. I would say that for her, it's very obviously there's a striking red hair palette against this more cool uh, blue color and your eye usually will get pulled back up here and then it gets you know kind of lingers around the yellow areas down here but then it gets pulled back up into the red and I did that very intentionally I wanted the red be striking against a more muted background oh I guess the the other one that I I would say because Chase I don't think does as much but uh, with my Christina piece this one, I actually might go back and edit this a bit, but this one had another one of those color palette that was very intentional. The petals that are around her are yellow, representing something deeper than just petals flowing along the water beside her. And this is where with illustration, try to put more thought into what you're adding and what you're doing so that there is a deeper and richer meaning behind your illustrations. Now for this one, yellow for me, like I said, represents hope. So the fact that she is in this body of water floating, surrounded by all these petals that have fallen off of a flower, which represent hope and life, and they're dead, just floating around her, it, to me, definitely had a double meaning. That was very intentional. Now, this one might be a little more on the nose. And sometimes with illustration, you might have little uh, details that are a little easier to digest for the viewer and the audience, and they can kind of pick up on what you're trying to say. And I, while I think that's good, I think you should dig a little deeper. So the Nate piece for me was a little deeper, but here with the yellow flowers, or the yellow dead petals floating around here, that had uh, a very symbolic meaning for me. And then the fact that she's floating on the water would be, this is more compositional or more of a storytelling of the idea that she's floating through life. And uh, that she, you know, it, it's a very literal, literal interpretation of, the where she is physically 
So that doesn't have to do so much with color, but in, in this case though, you see how I added like that lighter, more saturated green behind her? That was to help pull your eye toward the center because with saturation, our eye wants to go to more saturated areas. And in this example, our eye definitely wants to get pulled uh, toward the center. And there's a lot of contrast going on there, so I'm using a lot of uh, value visual cues. And just with characters in general, we want to look at the faces. So it's very obvious that wherever your eye travels within this piece, it'll come back here naturally just because that's a resting point for your eye. Uh, Tigil, or let's see here. Faithful says, what are your thoughts on Moana? Uh, oh man, the first, the opening sequence with baby Moana and even with her as a kid, I feel are so, so good. Uh, the, the color palettes within animation movies and the way that they're made, the 3D in them, the animation, spectacular. I think across the board, any animation studio, and I'm talking like Sony, DreamWorks, Pixar, Disney, literally Leica, um, what is that, Blue Sky, any, any animation studio nowadays, I feel like pumps out very quality, polished work. Now, I can't say the same for the storytelling abilities because I feel like sometimes that gets to be an afterthought. Because a lot of the times it looks so good, it can sell tickets just based on that polish. Uh, with Moana, I actually thought Moana was a strong movie. I think a lot of the encounters along their journey felt very random and almost tacked on. It didn't really feel like it added anything to them as characters or uh, felt necessary even. Like the little coconut people or the crab in the... Uh, that collected the shiny things. It just felt kind of tacked on, but I love the character of Moana, and I thought that opening, like half hour, I thought that was so great, especially with the baby Moana. The color, the colors in that with alone with the water, that animation is so gorgeous. I'm, I'm very blown away by animation nowadays because I remember playing Final Fantasy X and being so excited for the good graphic scenes, and that's what you would play for. It was like a reward for going through uh, the gameplay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, Tigil said, you have to watch Samsara. I know. Uh, that has been on my list. I feel like I'm saving it for a day where I really am just ready to be inspired. But that has been on so many top 10 lists of like visually intriguing and powerful movies that I, I know I have to. Uh, you say, I feel like you are one of the few people that I know that will love that movie. It's not really a movie, but a collection of gorgeous images. I agree. And I, I definitely will watch it. Uh, Digital also says, seriously, you might die of an inspiration overdose by watching that. I almost did. I would love Death by Inspiration. Sounds like a mixed cocktail or something. Uh, Breathing Color says, speaking of making money as an artist, a lot of my followers are people without money to buy commissions. How could I reach more people? Uh, good question. And this is something I honestly want to do an entire stream on. I won't do it next week. I think I might do it the week after because that way my convention season will be done and I can kind of give you and share with you guys uh, the numbers that I, maybe not the exact numbers, but uh, the growth that I've made in the past four years and what I think finally clicked for me and how me and some of my friends are starting to make a, a good return on the conventions we go to because of learning through failure. And just like becoming a better artist, becoming a better business person, which I feel like is necessary as a freelancer artist in the modern world, um, is a lot of it's done through experimentation. Now, another note to add on that though, it is the easiest time to make money as an artist now. Where like a hundred years ago, you'd probably be doing billboards or like doing little paintings at coffee shops or trying your, your darndest to sell a piece or two at, um, a uh, local anything it would be very local you can't get internationally renowned or renowned because oftentimes painters didn't become famous until after they died and at the time it was very hard for them it was a uh, it was a craft it was seen as another craft it would be like becoming a blacksmith to them a craftsmith or a blacksmith and an artist was kind of the same thing but nowadays it's definitely treated very differently where the art artistry world is treated uh, kind of on its own unique platform. And in today's day and age, though, it is so easy to reach a global audience. 
the the hard part is you're fighting a bunch of other people that also want that attention and that exposure. So yeah, I think as difficult as it becomes to want to battle these other artists for attention and followers, it's also the best time possible to be an artist, in my opinion. Because if you can breach your uh, target audience or a market that really enjoys your work and you continue to just get followers based on your work and you can make money based on the people that just want to see more of your creation coming out, then uh, life becomes enjoyable for an artist because then they can focus on the creative side rather than having finances kind of run their life. I've met and known too many artists that have money kind of dictate what they can and cannot do. And oftentimes it limits what they can do creatively as well, where maybe they can't do their own personal book or they can't do a collection of work that they want to because they have a freelance project that needs to be done to pay the bills. So like I said, uh, I mean, I guess we, we still have a half hour. Maybe I won't do a painting today. I guess I, we can just keep having a discussion. Uh, I'm definitely down for that if you guys are. Uh, so maybe we'll have more of a back and forth right now. And maybe, well, I'll cut this one a little early. So let's say the next 20 minutes, let's just have more of a discussion here. Um, the other thing with, uh, what was the, the second part of the question? How could I reach more people? Sorry, so I feel like I, I sidelined that question. So the way that I was able to reach more people, so I, I try to base it on personal experience so that I know it comes from an honest place or even from my, my friends' experiences so I know that it's something true. I feel like it's very easy to just say something willy-nilly and not actually mean it or know if it works. So I'm only going to speak from experiences that I know have worked or I've seen. Uh, for me, CG Cookie got me a little exposure in the beginning, but I would say it was so focused on 3D that I didn't gain a lot of followers. The, the time that I, I started really gaining followers was when I started doing uh, conventions when I was doing more fan art. And actually, no, it was before doing conventions, I was starting to do fan art. And it was like League of Legends, uh, primarily. Um, I did some Digimon. I did some Disney. There was a lot of different fan arts that I dabbled in. And what happened was I would find people that also liked that game or that movie, whatever it was, and they would, they would like it. And if they wanted to see more, they would follow. Now, it was very slow. It was like a trickle pace of gaining followers at that point. The Doing conventions then, actually meeting people in person, I feel like you gain followers just from doing that. And it might only be like 20, maybe it's 100. Whatever it is, it's still an amount of followers that want to see what you do from that point forward. Now, for me, it was a very slow pace. I would say the first like eight years of doing art like if I actually know, I'll start at 20. So from 20 to, and I'm 27 now. So from 20 to like 24, uh, those four years, it was very slow. I would say maybe, maybe 50 a month, maybe, um, maybe a hundred. If I had like one really good drawing that uh, reached a specific platform. The one thing that I did though, is I would compete in these League of Legends contests. And at the time I was drawing uh, Timo, which is like a little mouse, and Ziggs. And I was just doing these pieces that I felt kind of fit the Riot look. And I gained a lot of followers because those images were shared. And when um, your, Im your work starts to get shared by other people without you asking them to, that's when you start to gain a following naturally, organically. Because oftentimes we're told like on Facebook or Instagram that we should pay essentially more for more followers and they'll uh, put your stuff out there to a lot of the time to like these bots, these accounts that don't actually matter. All they do is they follow you so that your number becomes bigger. And the perception is that you're have more followers than you actually have real followers. Uh, anyways, it wasn't until I started doing more traditional work and that really started gaining traction and I, I took it more seriously, that's when I started gaining a lot, a lot of followers. And like I said, uh, even with like the making money stream, I feel like I could have an entire stream on how to gain followers and what's worked for me and what has definitely not worked for me. And then having the battle of, should I do art that speaks to me or should I do art that I know will be received well? 
And this is a battle that I feel all artists go through, um, especially today, where having social media is such a... I, I, would, I would honestly say it's necessary as an artist nowadays to have social media promote you. There are some artists that get so good that they leave social media, and that's fine because they're already so good they can get a job based on their portfolio. But for 98% of the rest of us, we're, we're really pushing the social platform and making it um, something that we can rely on if we like do a print sale or do a Kickstarter or do something. We can push it out to our followers and hopefully see some return from that. And a lot of the times it feels like a blind shot in the dark. You'd be like, well, I have this amount of followers. If I push out commissions... I should, you would think I would get like three or five commissions. And I've, I've spoken with people that have done this and that's not always the case. Sometimes the people that are following you, kind of like what you're saying, they don't have a lot of deep pockets. So they don't have the investment capital to want a drawing of yours or even uh, help promote your Kickstarter. And that's why social media is kind of a risky game to just rely on solely. And that I feel like that's an entire stream in itself. We could talk about social media and branding. But uh, in your case, how do you reach more people? To me, fan art really helped. And I know it probably comes across that I'm more of an original only artist and I promote only that. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I feel like it would be very hypocritical of me to say you should only do original art because that's what I do and that's what works for me because what worked for me in the past and what I initially got me exposure was doing fan art. And at conventions, most of my booth was fan art. And I made, that's how I made a lot of my money. My return on the booth investment and then some profit was on fan art. And I was able to connect and relate with people through our familiar interests, whether it was movies or anime or games, there was instantly a connection where I had something that they would want as a product and that helped gain followers. And in um, a deeper sense, it helped me get some extra cash because of that familiarity. So how do you reach more people? Honestly, I would do some fan art uh, in the beginning if you feel like you're, you're trying to gain more followers. That's what worked for me, and that's what I've seen work for other people. And I, at the same time, I've seen some of my friends like uh, Pui Chi. He has done pretty much all original from the start. And he is now doing very well at conventions with only original work. And his whole track record has always been original. So you can make it as an original artist all the way through. But I would definitely say it helped jumpstart me a little bit through different periods of doing fan art. The, the problem, that here's the seesaw effect though, is... If you do a lot of fan art, that's what people will come to expect from you. And if you only do fan art, then when you do original pieces, people might be confused or wondering why you're not doing and producing more fan art. So it's this delicate balance of if you want to become an original artist in the end, you really should do some fan art pieces, but always be throwing in original pieces along the way. Otherwise, when you start throwing, if you do like a switch to only original, you might lose a lot of followers because... There might be people out there that only watch fan art accounts. And if you are establishing yourself as a fan art account early on, that's what people are going to expect. And then when you lose followers, you can't really expect to be mad because that's what you've established. Um, that's what artist you've established you are. It's kind of like uh, there was an artist that I followed that got really upset when he did a move to more of not safe for work. And he started only doing that for a long time. And then when he started going back to original, he lost sales and he lost viewership. And it was confusing at the time for him. But to me, it was very obvious where you created an expectation level for your viewers and your followers. And then when you kind of switched it up on them, a lot of them didn't like it. And a lot of them didn't follow you anymore. So there is definitely a delicate balance with producing stuff for your followers or the people that are watching your art to expect but the one tip of advice that I feel like is consistent through all of it is produce quality. Always do your best to m create work that people would want to see and that's, a r that's pushing yourself creatively and you're constantly trying to better the skill and quality output that you're producing. 
All right, let me, I'm sure you guys have a lot more questions here. Oh, you do. Uh, sh Shin, I think it's Shana, 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 uh, 773 says, what kind of exercises do you think are good to do when trying to improve as an artist? I know the life drawing and figure drawing are, but are any good color ones? Yeah. Um, actually, if you go to the exercises at cgcookie.com, they're all free to try out for the concept side. And I have a few color ones specifically, so I would check those out. But in terms of challenging yourself like on your own, do literally this pig example that we did today. Take something familiar, paint it in a familiar manner, and then in the next drawing, make it kind of opposite. If you're getting a good warm feeling from your first drawing, create kind of a cool, creepy, or off-putting feeling in the second one using the same line art. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make this the next exercise on CG Cookie for June because I feel so strongly about this and I think you can learn a lot from having the same line art uh, and then having to put down a completely different feeling in each. And you know what? Maybe I'll do like three. So it's like happy, content, eerie, cold, and then like sad or something more melancholy. And uh, it's your job then just purely based on the colors that you're choosing to make that happen. Uh, C. Drifter says, could you mess with the colors in your Nate? I thought I read the pose entirely and nothing about the color scheme, but maybe I didn't realize how much the color was affecting my judgment. Could you mess with the colors in your Nate? I thought I read the um, You might have to reword that for me to understand what you're trying to say. Um, but yes, it was, the, the colors were very intentional of what I was trying to uh, throw down there. Licensee says, I'd identify with that pink line on the graph you made. Where was that graph? Oh, I think I deleted it. Uh, what was the pink one? Let me try to remember. Was that the one that was going, it started strong, but then it just plateaued and got worse? I think so. Uh, would you? What would you suggest for someone who has stagnated most of their life after 20 and just now can't find any artistic foothold? Any artistic endeavor seems to be a chore, but the need is ever-present. That's a great question. I literally last November, December, I was going through the same thing where I could recognize that I plateaued, and I also was recognizing that I was relying on what I knew worked. And it was bothering me. As an artist, it will, and I hate saying this, because I feel like this is getting into like sensitive territory, but as an artist, when you become bored with your work, I feel like it will affect your mood. And for me, it affected how I viewed myself, unfortunately. And you become unhappy with your work. And then as a reflection, you become unhappy with yourself. So I definitely understand what you're going through with that statement. Um, if you can't find any artistic foothold, you need to change it up. You need to do something that is pushing yourself and there is no excuse for it. And there's no like, but why? Or like, I don't think I can like literally throw that away. Any, any of that mentality, just throw in the garbage where it belongs because you need to start changing it up. Go to a convent, go to spectrum, fantastic art live. Honestly, every year I feel like that is like a creative injection of just pure inspiration. And every time I come out of it, I feel like I know what I need to do. And I, I highly, highly recommend that to, to all of you out there to go to <laughs> Spectrum or something similar where you're around other artists that are visibly at a higher level of skill and quality. And then it's very easy to look at your work compared to theirs and be like, okay, what is mine missing that theirs is hitting? And how can I bridge the gap there? Uh but for the, any artistic endeavor seems like a chore. Yeah, I definitely understand that too because oftentimes we, we invest so much time and effort and energy into our work. And then when we feel like we're not getting anywhere and we're like at that same plateau for a long period of time, it can become very frustrating to want to get better and want to get more of a foothold, but it seems like we're not gaining any traction. This is not an easy one to overcome. This is actually probably the hardest artistic endeavor that we make as artists, especially past the excitement of like getting out of college and getting your first job 
And usually like you're just so passionate about wanting to impress your boss or make it in the industry that you're willing to put in those extra hours. You're willing to do the extra mile. But then five years, 10 years later, however it might be, a lot of that is kind of muted. It's become, you know, less exciting. You're not trying to impress people as much as you, you were coming out of school. And the, the want to motivate yourself to do bigger pieces, it just lessens. And this is something that I literally for the first time in my life last year, I had to start, you know, reflecting on it and why I was feeling this way. And I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, it's going to be even more difficult moving forward because of all the knowledge that you've gained over the years, but that's good because that means that you can produce work that is of quality and can showcase your skill level, but you really got to invest the time. And I've, I feel like there's no easy way around it. If you want to produce good work, especially if you're you know, past that excitement point, you have to invest the time and energy. But the, the good thing is you have the skill and the knowledge to do so. You just have to literally sit at your table and start drawing. So I hope that helps because I know that's what I had to tell myself <laughs> late last year. Uh, Carnage Production says, Tim, when you started drawing, how did you study things you didn't know how to draw? Please give examples. Um, I think I just would. Uh, when, it, when I was in high school and college, I was so headstrong on like, I can draw anything. And it wasn't necessarily good per se, but I was so eager to just try to draw anything and everything because I felt like with a pencil in hand, I could capture something to the best of my ability. And then now that I'm older, I've learned to refine and really look at things more objectively and analyzing uh, what I can do to make my work better or in perspective or more interesting as a composition. Um, but when I would study something, I would, and this is something I've learned through teaching, I would do, there's a four-step process I usually look at when I'm observing something. One is you should be actively observing. If you are walking in a park, yeah, you're in an environment where you could be inspired, but if you're not actively thinking or really looking for it, you're not going to you know, observe or analyze anything. You're just walking through a park. But with our artistic eye, because we're, you know, that's how we work is everything can become an inspiration. Anything around you, this microphone with the way that the highlights are touching the top of the microphone or the way that's reflecting the color off my glove on the, the plastic around the edge. Everything can become an inspiration. So on your walk, when let's say you wanted to draw a flower, a specific flower, when I'm looking at that flower, I am observing the shapes. I'm looking at the way the light's falling on it. I'm looking at the way that the color is being affected by the light. I'm looking at the material properties. Is it reflecting light? Is it absorbing it? I am analyzing what I'm seeing. And then I'm interpreting um, what I'm seeing into how I would recreate it on paper. So I'm looking at I'm I'm looking at the shapes. I'm like okay, that's more of a circle, and I'm interpreting, or I'm interpreting how I would recreate that on the paper. And then the last one is executing. So it's through this whole. I I usually th say there's four things: observing, so just actually going out there and looking at the world, analyzing actually seeing what you're looking at and then uh, what's the next one interpreting so re figuring out how can I recreate that uh, drawing or painting or whatever medium that you're working with and then the fourth is executing so taking the previous three and then putting it down on paper um, and you know what I'm I wasn't gonna tangent but I'm gonna tangent right now the other thing I've noticed with getting older is all your life and especially in, through high school and in college, you've kind of built up a well, this very vast well of uh, motivation through uh, the, the things that you're seeing. There's like a, a reference pool well, I call it. And you're throwing all the anime that you're watching, all the movies, all the life experiences that you've had, uh, anything that has affected you and like the color associations. And it, literally, it's filling up this well, this vast pool that you can constantly you know, do your bucket, pull from, and then create a piece from. As we get older, this well that was so filled uh, up until that point slowly starts to become lower and lower. It drains. And then there comes a point when, this is why I relate to what Lights and Sea was talking about, where you're putting the bucket down the well 
and when you bring it back up, there's nothing, there's nothing in the bucket. There's no water. And, it, and if you guys are getting the metaphor I'm trying to say here, there's nothing that you can use in your painting. And oftentimes we're just looking at what we created before and we're recreating it again because we know that that's familiar. And this is a problem because I feel like when I was in high school and college, I had so many ideas. It was hard for me not to draw on every single homework that was put in front of me. And now there are times where I feel like I am reaching, I am desperately reaching for some creativity that I can put down on paper. And I'm sure sometimes you guys feel the same, but uh, for me, it can actually become, and you know what, maybe I'll just switch this over because I'm at the point where I'm just talking. Okay, so how do you overcome that? You need to start watching movies again. Start looking at video games. And I, I, it feels weird me even recommending that, but play video games. Maybe give yourself like one one video game a month that you just try to explore like on the weekends. I, I don't know what that method would be. But something where you're refilling that well of your, your visual library, as uh, Fang Zhu would call it, and over time, that well will, you know, start to fill up. And then every time you pull a bucket out, yeah, it might go a little lower. But as long as you're constantly still filling it up, then that creative energy, that source that you're getting a lot of your inspiration from will be there for you. And actually, you know what, maybe I'll visually depict this because I feel like I'm a visual learner. So for all of you other visual learners out there, it's like, here's your well. Here's you. So literally throughout our entire life, this is what I was talking about, where this, it's like, it's like filled. Because from age zero to age 21 or whatever it is, you're constantly throwing inspiration in this well. And then as you graduate, as you start to produce pieces, you're, you know, picking up one bucket at a time where all of a sudden, you know, it's getting lower and lower to the point where all of a sudden you're kind of like at rock bottom and every time you put the bucket down, nothing's coming back up. So this was something that I definitely realized for the first time about two years ago and it's been something that uh, I've been allowing myself to watch more movies because movies are probably my number one source of inspiration and just being in this crazy lifestyle I have living with six artists and traveling the country with conventions. I feel like it's, it, there's always something to inspire me. So put yourself in scenarios or situations where it becomes very easy to become inspired. And I, I promise that that will help your creativity and what you produce. Okay, let me, let me get some more questions here. We've got like 10 minutes left. Uh, Carnage Production says, Tim, when you started drawing, how did you... Oh, no, we, did, we just did that one. Uh, Resinope says, I think the movie Limitless uses color really nice. I have not heard of that one. I'm going to write that one down. And I guess, uh, like I was saying, I was going to recommend you guys some movies. I'm going to write those down while I'm answering these questions here. All right, so let me get another question before I write these down. Um, Faithful Imagination says, I've learned it's important that all aspects of your work should add to the story. How do you do that? Yeah, I 100% agree. I think when you look at the composition, I think it should be telling a story, the colors that you're using, what they're wearing, the materials, uh, how they're dressed, the hairstyles that they have. Everything should have a meaning behind it. And it's tough because then you see some artists that like spit paint something out. And yeah, it might be rendered really well or maybe it has technically, it's impressive, but it's, it's very shallow. There's nothing deep about it. When you look at it, you can tell that there wasn't much thought or there wasn't much energy or much of what the artist is trying to say in the piece. It's just a pretty picture. And as an artist, I feel like our, the work that you should do should be more than just a pretty picture. Now, this is, my, this is my opinion, so it's not necessarily what you guys should believe, but it's something that I feel strongly about that as an artist, if you really put yourself in your work and you put a lot of your effort and energy and thought into what you're doing, I feel like you will get a better result and a better return from doing so. 
Um, okay, let me write down a few. Uh, the fall, and some of these might be really weird. So, <laughs> if, if you guys are okay with writing or watching some weird movies, I'm gonna write down some weird movies. Oops, what am I? That's. I'm so caught up in my, my thought. That's supposed to be a U. And these are movies that specifically have some kind of color influence on them. So I'm not just writing movies that I personally love or like I felt a connection to the story. I'm, I'm going to write down movies that I think you should watch for the, their use of color and how they do it. And even though I thought The Cure for Wellness wasn't that great of a movie story-wise and the characters were iffy, the color palettes in this movie were gorgeous. Like I honestly promise you that uh, you'll walk away feeling like you have a few screenshots in your mind that you can work with later. What's the... While I'm doing this, let me look at what other questions we have to end this one off. And thank you guys for coming to more of this lecture stream. I know I tried to be more uh, drawing, or I tried to do more drawing ones, but every now and then something like this will come up where I, I just feel so inspired or I have it on my chest and I need to get it off because I feel like it's important for you guys uh, to hear and have a conversation together. So that's why I wanted to do this with you guys today. Uh, what is it's the Budapest? What was the other one that I really wanted you guys to watch? Oh, a single man. All right, so there's my list. So if you guys have any recommendations for me, I would, I would really honestly love to hear it because I'm, I'm one of those people where I try to watch a new movie every day or every other day. So I would love to hear and watch something new. All right, I'm going to look at these questions, and this is how we're going to end it off. I'm going to try to hit as many as I can before we cut the stream off. Sergeant Guava, hello, sir, says, I have tried social media a couple of times, but I don't seem to get any likes or follows. I've sold more copies of a print than I've gotten likes on it. Yeah, social media can be very tough. And I cannot sit here and pretend like it, it has been an easy journey for me. Because I think it's, and here's another thing, I think it's very easy to look at someone's follower count and think that they've had it easy or that um, they know what they're doing. Because someone might look at my Instagram and be like, well, you have 30, however many, 30,000 followers or whatever. Uh, it, it's easier for you to get followers or like uh, any any excuse where you throw it out or even like Loesch. Look at Loesch. She has, I think, how many now? Like 600,000? However many it is. And you just think it's easy. But it wasn't. For her, it was probably very difficult. And to get where she was now, she had to work tirelessly to you know, make it as an artist and get the exposure. And there is a, a lot of luck involved too. I don't want to say it's all because of the artist and the way that they're doing their work. Sometimes you get a lucky break. And honestly, think of like Mermaid, this challenge that was for this past month. There were some artists out there that got a lot more followers because they actively participated in Mermaid and they got followers because of that if you chose not to participate in something that is happening and it's current and it's, you know, happening right now, uh, then you are taking yourself out of a scenario where you could gain more followers. So if you put yourself in as many scenarios as possible, uh, if you kind of see what's trending and you, you know, put in your own two cents, maybe every, maybe w once in a while, some big artist will find your two cents and then share your page with a bunch of other people. There, and the reason that I brought Bloche is because when I was at 10,000 followers, she shared out my art, my red work, because she did a, um, an interpretation of red for me. 
And I gained like 3,000 followers from that. And would that have happened if I didn't reach out to Loesch and I ha- I'd talked to her before and, you know, have that conversation about doing a piece and if I didn't support her Kickstarter? No, but I put myself in a scenario where something like that becomes a possibility. So put yourself in as many situations where that possi- where, you know, possibilities become more and more and maybe even if only like 5% of those possibilities actually get a return from it, it's better than zero. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so put yourself in more scenarios where you'll get attention and exposure. And yeah, there is a little bit of luck attached to it. But like I said earlier, the one tip of advice that I was taught and the one thing that has rang true is always strive for quality within your work and eventually you will get noticed. And that's something that I can promise you. Because I, I try not to speak in absolutes, but that is one thing I promise you. If you strive for quality and you keep pushing yourself and you see the growth in your work, you will eventually get exposure, whether that's you know finally landing a job or becoming more of a social media uh, artist and that becomes kind of like your job, essentially. Uh, Art of Wubble says, uh, says, Ashley and Gabe are adamantly opposed to selling fan art and I think I agree with them. Do you think that you can get just as good of a following by doing fan art but not selling it? And of course, doing mostly original art as well and selling that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had a very interesting conversations with my roommates. If you guys don't know, I live with six artists and uh, I would say like half of us are on the, you know, fan arts okay board and the other half is uh, only do original. And just because we're on opposing viewpoints doesn't mean we have legit arguments. I would say they're discussions. And in this case, I feel like doing fan art isn't a crime. I feel like you're trying to gain gain exposure and it has helped me. It has helped key and it would be very hypocritical of me to say not to do it because that's what I did. And that's how I gained some following Um, in terms of selling it. Yeah. This is where it becomes a little bit more of a gray area because you could get in trouble. And I see the shift in trend in conventions being more toward the original side, if I was honest with you. So I think it becomes up to you if you want to put yourself in that situation where you risk selling fan art and getting in trouble for it. And that's where I think I do lean a little bit more on try to do more original work because then you know for sure you can't get in trouble. And especially if you sell online, it can't be traced back to you. So that's something to keep in mind if you you do want to do fan art. If you sell it, you are putting yourself at some legal risk. Now, usually with conventions, it's such a small-time thing that you don't see a lot of artists get in trouble because you walk down artist alleys and like like 95% of it's fan art. But you don't see 95% of the boots there getting, you know, rejected and told they have to leave because they're doing fan art. Like usually that doesn't happen. But on the odd chance that, yeah, Marvel or whoever you're doing fan art of is walking around artist alley and they tell you to take down your stuff, yeah, you could get in trouble for doing that. So yeah, I I have very mixed opinions about it. I don't think one is right or one is wrong. I think what has worked for myself has been starting with fan art and I I think engaging with other people that are passionate about similar video games and gaining that exposure through doing the contests has definitely helped me get a following back when I had none. So I think that would be my opinion uh, with that. To do Um, CG Rifters, I think, oh yeah, there we go, says, can you load your Nate into Photoshop and do change the colors, see how they change the mood of the painting? Yes, I will. Um, this I know this probably won't look that great, though, because of how many colors are involved that the hue and saturation will look really weird when we change it. All right, let's merge all these layers together. And then I'll do a color balance. So like I said, this we probably couldn't get the look that we want. But let's see if we can, you know what? I'll just do a hue and saturation shift. So yeah, imagine if it was something like this. Now all of a sudden we get like there's a cold atmosphere happening behind and the purple 
hues inside. This is almost like a miss. Like this to me doesn't work as well because there is no underlying storytelling that's going on here. Unless if let's say in the book, there was like a parade of blue lights that passes by Nate's window every night. And there's something behind it um, that has to be explained. And I think with illustration, if something has to be explained to make sense, then you kind of miss the mark on being able to tell a story through a, a visual language. And with this piece with Nate, yeah, you could make a story associated with it and have it make sense contextually if you have uh, words to back it up. But since I like to have stories be kind of able to be processed from just looking at a single image, I think that's why it, this one works uh, with the yellow outside the window, not so much with the blue. Okay, let me find one more question and we're going to end off the stream here. Uh, Guy Webb says, when I work on a painting, traditionally my art teacher says that straight lines kill my work and needs to have more flow. Um, or I think this is going off your last message. Or no, to have more flow. So yeah, I, I kind of have the same problem where a lot of my stuff looks more stiff, but it is intentional. I feel like with the, like even with like Wes Anderson films, everything's center frame typically. And it, there's a reason behind center framing. This, this is like a whole nother tangent that I could go off of. But usually what center framing does is it directs your attention right to the center. It is usually symmetrical. So oftentimes our eye visually is going right toward the center of whatever that piece is. Nate is a good example of that because immediately you go towards his face, not only because it's a center frame piece, but because of the way that I contrasted the saturation. The only really pop of color is right near his face, so immediately your eye is drawn right there. That was more intentional, and I feel like uh, more obvious of a choice, but it's something that I, I really wanted the attention to be directed down there, and that's how I chose to, to make it. Um, oh man, we're already over four o'clock. Uh, okay. Let me find one more question here. Oh, yeah. So then to answer your question, uh, Guy Webb, try to work with uh, more action lines within your work. Be more gestural. It's something that I've had to force myself to do, and it has worked, admittedly, to put more energy within your piece just in the foundation lines, where sometimes if you have very stiff lines and they're straight everywhere, it can come across as uh, very static. And this is coming from someone that draws more stiff poses and uh, more static environments uh, just by changing it up a little bit can really affect your piece so even with like this Nate one having the letters be more curvy adds some contrast to everything being very blocky and straight and stiff looking all right last question is from Tizzle saying yeah I'm the perfect example I was following this artist and I got in contact with him I even sent him flowers and now I'm like world famous I got stopped like 200 times a day by people wanting my autograph Man, you are living the life, Digital. I wish. Uh, your, your goals, That's my goals is to be you one day. It'd be world famous getting stopped 200 times a day for an autograph. Oh, what a life. Uh, actually, that would probably be pretty terrible. Okay. Could you imagine being stopped 200 times a day? That's like at least, what? That's like at least 20 times an hour? That's uh, terrible. Okay. We're going to end off the stream. Thank you guys so much for coming to this. I know this was more of a lecture stream today and we didn't get a lot of painting done, but I'm glad that you guys kind of stuck it out with me today and we were able to talk about this subject matter, which I find very important in uh, creating illustrations that I have deeper meaning besides just the surface level. And especially with color incorporation, color can very much change the emotion and the mood drastically based on the colors you're choosing. Please experiment with the colors in your pieces. I promise you will have better quality outputs if you experiment with color and you start to understand it further. So thank you again. And next week we're going to be doing the red siblings. We're going to be doing red, we're like a pro or not maybe a bust of red's older brothers. And I'm going to show how to show or how to draw characters that are familiar looking. Um, and they resemblance like a family lineage and uh, still adding like somewhat distinguished traits to each because uh, something else that I, I think I, 
struggle with sometimes is having characters look too similar to one another and how to have a few distinctions to each to separate them from one another. It's like the Final Fantasy curse where all the characters feel like you could swap out the hair and they would be the same uh, character or they'd be a different character if you just swap the hair out. So we're going to be talking about that next week. And uh, let's see if there's any news. The new 6.0 site for CG Cookie is coming out soon. It's a very big deal for us at CG Cookie, and we're very excited to share it out with you because the site will look so much better. I promise you guys. Uh, just even the community form alone, it it feels so much more ingrained, and it's easier to talk with people, and uh, it's it's so much better. And then we have a contest that will follow up in July. I have a lot of third art third-party artists that are going to be doing tutorials for the site. So I'm really excited to announce those, but I'm going to keep those a secret because I got to have uh, something to surprise you guys with in the future. All right, that's all I got. That's all I got. Thank you guys. I know, and we a little overboard, but I think just because we had a lot to talk about today. And I'm going to be posting the movies that in influenced me on the color spectrum on that community post. And if you guys have any, I would love to watch them. So please put them uh, on that a community page below and you can find that uh, link below so i think that's all i got yep okay thank you guys again and hopefully we'll see you next week all right bye 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 <laughs>